Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the snack bar where you get your weekly bites of everything movies. My name is Geraldine and with me I have... Hi, I'm Jed Young. Yes, so it's Comic Con week. Oh boy. San Diego Comic Con specifically and that's a huge event. So there's a lot of stuff that came out from Warner Brothers and Disney. It's specifically Marvel. So um, before we talk about that, we are going to talk about our review for this week which is Star Trek Beyond. But before that, Jed... Have you watched anything this week? I watched two really crummy, like, lousy comedies this week. So I'll talk very briefly about that. The first one is this thing called Bad Moms, and it's written and directed by the writers of the Hangover trilogy, John Lucas and Scott Moore. It stars Mila Kunis as this woman who has been juggling motherhood and work, and she's taking care of two kids and she's completely burned out, so she decides to rebel against all of the standards of what makes a perfect parent and goes on this crazy drunken bender together with her two friends, one of whom is played by Catherine Han. She's the outspoken, loud mom. And then you've got Kristen Bell, who plays the weird, awkward mom. So the three of them team up together, and they, of course, earn the ire of Christina Applegate, who plays this very icy, bitchy, queen bee ruler of the Parent-Teacher Association. So she's really angry that the image of the school is being ruined. It sounds so sad. (laughs) Yeah, I know, right? It's so cliche, and these are really funny women. Like, I love Mila Kunis, Kristen Bell, and Catherine Hahn in other stuff that they have done, but the material is really weak. And it's one of those movies where it's sort of like, oh, you know, girls can be crude too, and ladies can do all the jokes about private parts and swear. And it's really desperate, and it's not funny. Yeah, it sounds like it. The thing that's But is there any silver lining to it? The silver lining is that the three of them are funny by themselves and they have decent chemistry. And I guess the premise is relatable to an extent. If you are a busy mother, you will relate to the struggle of having to balance all of that. And there's a tiny bit of truth somewhere. But the worst part of the movie is that it tries to mix in sentimentality and goopiness into all of this crudeness. So it's like, oh, you're supposed to laugh, but you're also supposed to feel something. And they do this thing during the end credits, which is really manipulative. Like, I don't know whether I should give it away or not. It's, I don't know. That's all right. Just give it away. Yeah. So what they have, all right, brace yourself, is they get the real life mothers of each actress. So Kristen Bell and her mama sitting there, and then Mila Kunis and her mama sitting there. Catherine Hunt and her mama sitting there, Annie Mumolo and her mama sitting there, Jada Pinkett Smith and her mama sitting there, and they're all interviewing each other about, oh, what's it like raising them? Then they're laughing and they're crying, and it's so manipulative, and it's kind of like something you would see on a talk show on daytime TV, but they're using that as the end credits to this crude comedy, and it feels, it's so cheap. I really was kind of disgusted yeah. by that. <laughs> it feels, um... Feels like they don't know what like they don't believe in their film, so this they decide to just use this as a feel good thing before you go out the film, so that you wouldn't think that it's as bad as it is. I think that's exactly right, and I think it's also a little bit a a little bit of that is probably chalked up to the filmmakers thinking women probably don't really really like the kind of humor we're doing, so we're gonna soften this up, and I think that's kind of condescending. Mm-hmm. I liked it in that it's kind it's the only part of the movie that felt real to an extent, but real is in quotation marks because it is so engineered and it's so manipulative. I thought it was I thought it was cool for a second and then I realized what they're doing. I was like, ugh. Yeah, so it's it's basically the equivalent of a like you know how some films they end with um what what's NG? Outtakes, Outtakes yeah. yeah, and then Bloopers. you see them just riffing on, and it's like it's clearly because you don't believe in your comedy that's so why you're having these outtakes as your credits so that people can laugh at it. I think I that's know. fine. That, that's always how I feel about outtakes. Like I, I like outtakes to a certain degree, and I like it with Jackie Chan because a lot of them are sort of showing the stunts going wrong or him flubbing his English, and that stuff feels genuine. But this is different. This is something that they had to add on, they brought in. And I feel like maybe this was a last minute thing. This was like after they tested it with the audience, like, okay, let's bring in each of the actresses' mothers to go and sit down and have this interview. And it is sweet, but 
part of me is like, what would do these women think watching their daughters like embarrassing themselves and partaking in all of this? Like, it's I'm not a prude. It's okay for a movie to have dirty jokes if they have a point or if they're original or they're trying to say something. But this just felt so cheap and really disgusting. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much better to describe it. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Next cruddy film that you watch. This is an interesting one. This is called Nine Lives, and it's a movie in which Kevin Spacey turns into a cat. Yeah, I heard of that. <laughs> this is. It's um. It's very in the vein of Shaggy Dog, I guess. It's a hundred percent ripoff of the Shaggy Dog. It's beat for beat the Shaggy Dog, completely and utterly. And it's so weird. It feels like everybody involved in this lost some kind of bet. Because the director is Barry Sonnenfeld, who was once quite hot in Hollywood because he did Men in Black 1 and 2, and then he did Men in Black 3 as well. But somewhere along the way, he fell out of... I think at one point, he was actually supposed to do a movie for DC. He was going to do the Metal Man movie, but I didn't hear anything about that after a while. So, and I read an interview with him. He's allergic to cats, and he hates cats. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's really okay. weird. Yeah, why are you doing a cat movie? And the main stars, of course, Kevin Spacey. I cannot fathom why he needs the money from this because his pay per episode for House of Cards is reportedly a million dollars. So you're making a million dollars per episode in House of Cards. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this silly kids film? But maybe he has kids that he wants to please, and he's like, hmm, House of Cards isn't for them, he so he decided not. to do this weird thing. He actually doesn't have oh. kids. Yeah, I looked that up. <laughs> I was like, that's the only logical explanation. Marginally, maybe nieces and nephews, I don't know. And his wife in this movie is Jennifer Garner. Hmm? And then Christopher Walken is also in this movie. He's basically playing exactly the same role he played in Click, which is the mystical shop owner who, with a dose of magical realism, makes the protagonist rethink his life. Yeah, you're right. This sounds like someone lost a bet. It does, yes. doesn't it? Yeah, and it's uh, yeah. it's produced by Europocore, which is the company that is owned by Luc Besson, the guy who does all the Transporter movies, and he mainly produces French action films, so I don't know what they're doing here. It's it's <laughs> weird, but one thing that was really fun for me is spotting all the DC TV and movie actors in this film. So Kevin Spacey is, of course, Lex Luthor in Superman Returns. And then Christopher Walken was in Batman Returns. He was Max Shrek. And Robbie Amell plays Kevin Spacey's son from his first marriage. So Robbie Amell is the cousin of Stephen Amell. And he played Ronnie Raymond Firestorm on The Flash. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Kevin Spacey's young daughter is played by Melina Weissman, who plays flashback like young Kara zor in Supergirl. And she also played young April O'Neil in the 2014 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film. And uh, I, I love that you kind of have to get out the film by thinking, all right, just think of comic book references. Yes, that's, that's what I was doing through the whole thing. And the most surprising for me was the guy that Jennifer Garner is having an affair with is Teddy Sears, who played Jay Garrick in not exactly the real Jay Garrick, but the guy pretending to be Jay Garrick. And then you find out who he is at the end of the season in Flash. So Wait, hang on. Don't. Don't spoil that. I still haven't watched Flash yet. He's He calls himself Jay Garrick, but maybe he is or maybe he isn't. So that's the whole mystery of the season. Well, he clearly isn't now. Alright, it's alright. <laughs> Oops. You haven't watched the no, season 2 right. of Flash yet? It's been over I haven't months. finished watching the season. Oh, okay. I've like, I'm, he just got caught by Reverse Flash or whatever his name is. I forgot. Oh, all right. What's his name? The main villain? Zoom. Zoom, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, so there's something there, but... Anyway, whoops. <laughs> I'm so sorry about <laughs> that. Right. And we were discussing this movie all things. But it's it's bizarre. This is a really, really weird one. And it has moments of so bad it's good. But on the whole, it's definitely not worth it. Okay. Yeah, it, it, alright. I mean, this, these kind of films, it's just... They're, they're easy to make. They cost so little. And it's only there for kids, and mainly for kids, and parents are forced to go there, and maybe they'll gain back some money from that. So, it, it's not really something that's for everyone, because it's it's too... I guess it's like the Yogi Bear of this year. You know, there it's, is... it's a live-action film for kids, and only for kids, and no one else. There is some entertainment value to be derived from Kevin Spacey's voice acting. So, he's very cynical and very sardonic, and... You just imagine that this is not the character. You imagine that it's Kevin Spacey himself trapped in a cat, and it's much, much funnier. Like, well, 
points where the cat goes like, oh dear lord, have mercy. And just imagine that that's really Kevin Spacey in the recording booth talking about his own predicament. <laughs> I bet he lost the bet. I, I, I just don't see him doing these kind of things. I need to know the story behind this. I'm sure there's a really fascinating like Hollywood political story behind this of how everyone got trapped into doing this movie. There has to be. <laughs> Alright, so hopefully it'll come out soon, as in that story. But let's go on to Star Trek Beyond. Yeah. So what is Star Trek Beyond about, Jed? Star Trek Beyond is the third movie in the rebooted Star Trek series that started with 2009 Star Trek and continued with 2013 Star Trek Into Darkness. So right now, we're just under three years into the Enterprise's five-year-long mission into deep space. And we see Kirk. In the opening of the film, he's on an away mission, and then he comes back, and he's kind of tired of it. He's a little bit fatigued, and the whole crew needs a break from the routine. So they dock at Yorktown, which is the brand new Federation space station, where they're supposed to go for a little break. However, it happens that they're called away on what is supposed to be a routine rescue mission, but the Enterprise gets ambushed and attacked by these vicious ships called Vs. So the Enterprise is crippled, and the crew is stranded on a planet called Ultimate. They have no idea how to get off. So while they're on the planet, Scotty meets and befriends this woman called Jayla, and she has herself been stranded on the planet, and she has a long-standing vendetta with Kral. Kral is an alien, played by Idris Elba, who is the main villain of the film. And so he's the guy who has been controlling the bees, and he is the one who crippled the Enterprise. So now the Enterprise crew has to work together with Jayla to find to escape from Kral and find a way to get off of Alpha. Okay, so I know you said that the villain wasn't very good, but I thought he was alright. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't really like him. Yeah, I mean, he, he has his reasons. Like, at least he's not like, I want to see the world burn, even though that is his goal. But it's just, there's a reason to that, and I do like it. But, um, okay, the first thing that shocked, well, the second thing that shocked me about this film was that they didn't really spend that much time on this planet. I felt like they were just there for a while, maybe like 45 minutes of the film. And then after that, it was just gone. But maybe it's longer than that, and the pacing is just good. But overall, I think the film... It's not as good as I thought it was going to be, especially since critics were praising it like crazy. But I still had a really good time. And I think I'm I'm, I'm almost like you, Jed. Like you said that you weren't a huge fan of this film yeah. as much as the critics were. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I agree. Like, I love the character stuff, but, you know, it felt a little bit long. And also the action scenes were just so bad. Yeah, I think we're kind mm-hmm. of on the same page with that. I guess... What works in this movie is, as you said, the character stuff, and you get the sense that this cast works so well together, and they've all clicked, and they all fit the characters just as well as they could. And it's it's really like coming home, like seeing all of them on the bridge together, there's this comforting feeling to that. And I don't really even get that from Avengers when I see all of them together again. Like, it's fun, yeah. but you know what I mean, right? That sense of camaraderie and that sense of family. I think this this cast really has that nailed down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm kind of upset that uh, Uhura didn't have much to do in this film. Yeah, Uhura and Sulu didn't have a lot to do in this one because they were spending most of the movie together and away from the rest of the action. Mm-hmm. But I, I like what, well, you know, the whole Sulu is gay thing, right? Yeah. I, I like that they didn't really zoom in on that but they just showed like one shot of him with his husband and his child it was handled so and well, i like yeah. that yeah and and i i like that it sort of had this emotional weight to it at the end of the film because of what may happen to his family if he doesn't stop the bad guy yeah and i like that and and yeah i um I mean, that's, that's the Sulu thing for me. But Ahura, she she really didn't have that much to do at all. Yeah, I was disappointed that Ahura didn't have that much to do. And I feel that it's a case of they had a strong female protagonist and they were like, okay, now we can kind of forget about Ahura. We only have room for one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which is Jayla, who is awesome, by the way. Yeah, Um. first, before we go to Jayla, I'll talk a little bit about the Sulu thing. I really like okay. that bit in the in the opening captain's log where he's talking about the sacrifices that the crew have to make and then you see a little photo of Sulu's daughter on the dashboard and oh I, I like that touch I think that that was a very subtle way to do it without it being manipulative 
Mm-hmm. Yep, I agree. And as soon as and I like that sorry, they pretty much. Sorry, I like that it pretty much said, hey, um, some people fall in love and some people fall out of love in this ship. And it's like, yeah, that, that's something that would happen. You don't really see that that often. And I'm kind of surprised at how big the Enterprise is. I never realized it was that huge. It's almost like a cruise ship. Yeah. I mean, it is, right? It, it but is. But it's a marine cruise ship thing. That was one of the complaints that people had about the first reboot film, Star Trek 09, is that sci- sci-fi writers don't have a sense of scale. And... This version of the Enterprise is vastly larger than the versions in the earlier shows and movies. But I liked it. I think they give you a sense of the geography within the ship. And one thing that I think they handled really well in this movie is the sense of camaraderie of the whole crew, not just of the main crew. And the whole idea of what happens to the crew of the Enterprise when the one thing that binds them together, the ship, is taken away from them. How do they stay together as a unit? And that was what Simon Peck had as his imperative when he was when he was writing the script because he said that he got into a big argument with Justin Lin over destroying the Enterprise. Simon Peck thought that was a very gimmicky idea and it's been done before. But then he realized what Justin Lin was trying to do and it wasn't just blow stuff up for the sake of it. It was that take away the one thing all of these people have in common and then what's going to keep them See? together. Yeah, and I like that. I think that that worked. Yeah, I, I loved it too. I, I love the sense of family without... I guess because this is... This is by the same guy who did Fast and Furious, right? So he knows a thing or two about family. And instead of saying family so many times in a film, Familiar. they show it. And I think it's really, really great. <laughs> and yeah, I, I like the pairings that they did for the film. Yeah, when they get stranded is, you know, and they group off. Yeah. yeah. Like Simon Peck is on his own and then he finds Jayla. And then um, what's uh, what's the German guy? Is he German? Russian. And, and Chekhov, and, uh, Russian, sorry. Chekhov and Kurt are together. Yeah. Yeah, and um, of course Spock and Bone. That's right, yeah, so that's our main. And then Sulu and Uhura are together and they are kidnapped. Well, they didn't do that much no. together. Yeah, they are both in <laughs> captivity. They're mostly in. They're mostly being held by Kral and they have to figure out a way to get the other Enterprise crew members free. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I like that pairing because it's it's a very odd, it's like very odd pairings and it's really fun to see them interact with each other. Yeah, you get a chance to explore the dynamics in ways that have not been done with this particular cast yet which was fun and i think that they took advantage of the opportunity to write some really funny lines and have some very honest moments some very sincere character interactions i was kind of surprised by how much heart this movie had well i was prepared for it because i heard it's really good so i ended up being slightly disappointed yeah i i gave it a three and a half out of five and I honestly still really enjoy Into Darkness and I feel that a lot of people were very ready to go into this and wanted to completely forget Into Darkness, especially those mm. people who were upset mainly about the whole thing they did with is Cumberbatch Khan, is he not Khan, and they felt that that was a betrayal. So they didn't have any of that going on with this one. <laughs> yeah. But still, like, the Um, reveal, the villain's backstory, when they did that, I was very disappointed with it. Oh, I I was surprised by that. I didn't think of that. I thought the plot twist was pretty cool in this film. But then again, like I said, I'm pretty dumb, so I didn't see it coming. No, I didn't uh, see it coming either, but when it, like, when I put it together, it felt like a bit of a letdown. Hmm, okay. It's okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, so... Funny. Let's talk about the the comedy in this film. Did you think it was really funny? I I thought the bones and and Spock thing it wasn't that funny. I it had a lot more heart to it than how do you guys, uh hang on let me repeat that. I thought it was a lot darker and not that funny because you know he started talking about old Spock and what happened to him. Yeah, they and had I think a little like campfire bonding moment. Yeah, and I think what they did with uh Leonard Nimoy's character it's it's great very sad it's very poignant mm-hmm. but it honors him and that that sort of that affected um this spot a lot yeah and i like the conversations he had with bones about you know mortality and stuff it's just too much of a spoiler this is in the this is in the trailer so no it's it's not too much of a spoiler i mean with the way that with how the film handles Leonard Nimoy's passing is very sensitive and it's worked in as a character development point for 
young Spock in a very organic way. It feels it doesn't feel like something which was hastily rewritten. It feels like they heard the news of Leonard Nimoy's passing and they worked on the script from there. It doesn't feel like they jammed it in, like, oh, we have to fit a clumsy tribute in somewhere. Yeah. It it, it really worked super well. And that's why I like the Spock and Bones thing. I didn't think it was... I don't know. A lot of people say it was very funny and they loved your interaction. And I did, but for very different reasons. Like, I thought it was... It was a lot more heartfelt than I anticipated because I've, I, I, I thought it was you know going to be like goofy and stuff like that, but it wasn't. It was, it was about Spock. It was about how he felt, and it's great. It's like you really learn a lot about his character and what his character is going through. But um, at the same time, I also feel like Spock has been shafted to the background, and it was more about Kirk and about Jayla. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with that because Into Darkness and the first Star Trek reboot. Um, concentrated a little bit on him but I was also sort of kind of sad that he wasn't in the foreground that much but Kirk was so I guess you know because he's the main character yeah with regards to the comedy I think that the opening scene sets the tone really well the opening scene felt just the right pitch of humor it was wacky and it had Kirk in a situation and after that scene he says oh my shirt got ripped again which is a reference to how Kirk's shirt always gets torn apart for no reason so that mm-hmm. yeah and so that William Shatner can show off his 60s body <laughs> which by <laughs> those standards apparently was sexy I don't see it anyway and and there's such the humor there's a little bit that's a meta and I love the, the line during his captain's log where he describes their adventures as episodic I first start laughing mm-hmm. I like it I think that most of the humor works organically and I'm glad that it's not a laugh out loud comedy, that it's not overwhelmed by people trying to be funny because that could easily step over the tension, step over the drama or step over the action beats. And I think the comedy worked best when it was in the middle of action. The whole sequence where they were trying to jumpstart this ship later on and they're like not sure whether or not it will work. And everyone, everyone is sort of winging it, and Kirk wings it all the time. And I, I love Kirk winging it. I think they derive a lot of humor from his recklessness or his spontaneity. Spontaneity. Oh, over that word so much, <laughs> and that word. Sorry, right, yeah. me too. It's Simon Peck writing it with Doug Jung, and Doug Jung's cameo is as Sulu's husband Ben. So that's the other screenwriter. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. See, last I time. would never have known that. I thought that was a nice touch. Yeah, okay. So one thing I was really happy about, which I was a bit wary of, is that the movie didn't become the Scotty show. Which Oh, yeah. okay, because he's writing it. Exactly. So I was worried that it might he might get carried away and give himself a lot to do as a vanity project. But he's smarter than what I thought he would be, so my apologies to Simon Peck, not that he would ever listen to this. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's great in the film, but it's really... It, it, I think this is more about Spock story more than anyone in this in this film Spock? especially no sorry not Spock Kirk damn it yeah yeah it's Kirk's art and the, all the movies have and Spock is given nothing oh he is given something but he's I, I sorry I'm still like really distracted by how he wasn't given much to do Spock I was actually okay with it because I did feel like I missed Zachary Quinto and I wanted more of him on screen. But I think that the dynamic between Kirk and Spock has been played out quite a bit already, even though it's only three films into the new series. I think we've seen as much development between them as I need for the time being. And there's this image yeah. here, there's this webcomic that you might have seen where it sums up Spock's, Spock and Kirk's relationship. Which is Spock goes to not do the thing. And then Kirk flails his arms and goes, I'm gonna do the thing. <laughs> so it's it, it's basically that. Which is it's really funny how true that is. And I'm glad they did not play that out. They did not have Spock just scolding Kirk or nagging Kirk through the whole thing. It was him and Bones. And I thought that there was a lot more opportunity to explore different character dynamics. It's, yeah. yeah I, 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 I like sorry, it too. I like that... It, Sorry, I like that it's not about Kirk and Spock and their relationship again because we yeah. know that they lo- they like each other a lot. I won't say love. I guess they do love each other in a brotherly sense. But it's it's like 
because Spock is with another secondary character, he isn't given much to do, and I, I'm just repeating myself all over again. And it's, it's because of that, I, I feel like he's, because he's not with Kirk, they sort of just shafted him aside and gave more arc to the newcomer, which is Jayla. Can we talk about Jayla? Sure, let's go. Yeah, let's talk about Jayla. So Jayla is played by Sophia Butella, whom most of you would know as Gazelle, the bladed leg henchwoman of Samuel Jackson's mm-hmm. character in Kingsman The Secret Service. And I feel like she's going to become quite a big star. She's already got a bunch of things lined up. This character... She's really good. She's great. <laughs> This character felt a lot to me like Ray from The Force Awakens because they are both scavengers, they both have foggy family pasts and they. my dad actually pointed out that they both wield staffs as their primary weapons and then they live in like... Well, I, I, I didn't connect those two together. And they live in like... But hollowed, that's interesting. Yeah, it is, right? They live in like hollowed out ships. It's definitely not a case of Star Trek copying Star Wars because this was already in production by the time Force Awakens came out. But it shows you what the popular archetype for like a strong female character is nowadays. <laughs> yeah. But she's still really, really cool. And I like her backstory a lot. Yeah. I like the little bits of personality they gave her. Some of it was a bit cutesy, like her getting her mixing up characters' names. But it was fun because she does have a reason to be in the story and you need an outsider's perspective. Yeah. I also like that, you know, she's really into the boombox. <laughs> which I thought was really, really cute. I like the beeps what and I the like shouting. Ab- <laughs> yeah. It's cute. What I love about her is that she she is a character. She's just not she she's not just a badass. She has flaws. She has She's vulnerable, and yeah, that's that's really nice that they made a badass a character as well. And that was what I was afraid of when I came into this film, which was, okay, we have another badass female character, but is she going to be anything more than that? And she is, and it's really, really g- great to see another kick-ass female. Yeah, I agree with you. I felt that I'm a little bit different in the regard that I felt there were moments in the film where she did come off as mandated by corporate where it's like someone passed the memo down to Simon Peck and Doug Jung and said, hey, guess we know character. And that was what they came up with. But she is generally more than that. I don't want to take anything away from the character. And what I feel is the best thing about this is she feels like she fits within the Star Trek universe. It doesn't feel like an inorganic addition. And it's a great new character. Mm-hmm. And she's a new character, right? She's never been in any Star Trek film before. Yeah, she's a completely original creation. And the character is actually based off of... Apparently, it's based off of Jennifer Lawrence's character in Winter's Bone, which is the movie she mm. was nominated for an Oscar yeah, for. Yeah, I heard that. And that's why she's named Jayla. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was funny. Like, J-Law. <laughs> yeah, so, good film. I liked it. We, we better go on to spoilers in case we lose track of time. The actions were terrible. The action scenes were terrible. Too much shaky cam. But I still recommend it for uh, people to watch because it's a really fun film. I don't think you'll hate your time there. And if even if you haven't watched the past two Star Trek reboots, I think that this is perfectly fine because it feels like a very self-contained film. It is, yeah. There are a few things I have to say about the action. People were worried that this would become too much like Fast and Furious in space. I don't think it... It kind of was at the end. I think it is a little bit, but my main problem with the action was the shaky cam, like you said. And there's a set-piece fight sequence between Jayla and Manas. And Manas is the right-hand man of Prowl. He's played by Joe Taslim from The Raid. And he was also Mm. in Furious 6. So this is a martial arts expert. I was like, all right, we're going to get two fighters brawling and we're going to see them duke it out. And I can't tell anything apart. So that was very disappointing. But there are certain directorial flourishes that Justin Lin does that I really enjoyed. There's one bit where it's the, it's like a GoPro camera which is stuck to the middle beam that holds up the saucer of the Enterprise and you see that POV as a ship leaves the octa. I thought that was a very clever touch. Yep, yep, yep. I, I think I know what shot you're talking about. Yeah, because it's like everybody who makes these car chase movies always attaches GoPro cameras to the cars. It's like, what if we attach a GoPro camera to the spaceship? Which was cool. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, so, sorry, so go I ahead. guess you recommend this. So I guess you recommend this. Oh, we're not in spoilers yet, right? No, we're not. 
I would recommend this. It's a solid movie. I don't think it's spectacular, and people have been raving about it. I think it actually has a higher Rotten Tomato score than Into Darkness and 09. No, no, no I think it's like 80%. Oh, no. it dropped. 85%? Okay. All right, yeah, so it's it's slightly below Into Darkness and 09. I think when everyone saw the trailer for this, they were so worried that it was going to completely ruin everything. It's fine, it's solid, it's. Some parts are a little it's, generic. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And. You know, like the trailer that everyone hated, which is the first one. It's, it's the most accurate I feel to this film, the tone of this film, and it's not too bad. Like, I, I don't know. Like, do you feel that way? Do you think that the first trailer was more honest towards what this movie was going to be about, as opposed to the two, you know, darker, sad music trailers? Not really. For the for the main reason that the first trailer, which was built around Sabotage by the Beastie Boys, it plays up the action and it doesn't give you any hint that there's going to be heart in the movie. And I think they should have sold it on both points. They should have sold it as there'll be action, but we'll also have character, we'll also have character development, we'll also have dynamics that we've not seen before from the crew. I think they really should have played up the crew. They should have played up these characters and that aren't you happy to see them back on screen? Aren't you excited to see the adventures and the conflicts or or the friendships that arise from this group? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I can see that. That makes sense, right? I, I hope. Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Okay, so let's go on to spoilers. Spoilers, yeah. Um, I thought, okay, speaking of Zavotouch, that sequence was really weird. How they used that song... And then it was used to break the connection between the bee alien things. I I was prepared to hate it, but I found myself thinking it was pretty clever. So here's the reason yeah, why. It was really fun. It was, it was fun. really, really fun. Here's the reason why Sabotage is in this. Because that's a song that Young Kirk is listening to in his car when he steals the car from his dad in Star Trek 09. Yeah. So uh... they, they tie that back in. And... J.J. Abrams has this thing with Beastie Boys. I, I don't know what where it comes from, but he must have been a fan when he was younger. Because there's a character in The Force Awakens called Allo Atsi or Allo Asti, and that is a play on Hello Nasty, which is another Beastie Boys song. So he's got a lot of Beastie Boys in jokes in his work for some reason. So, yeah, I, I like that scene a lot. It was It made me smile. Even though it didn't feel very Star Trek. Yeah, this the bit that I that I thought was really funny is when Bones asks Spock, "Is this classical music?" And Spock says, "Yes, I <laughs> love that line. It's so good." Um, yeah, another and, level and, of sorry, another level of meaning to that line is people have always compared Star Trek to classical music and Star Wars to rock and roll. So that's another significance, mm-hmm. another level of significance too. Okay. Yeah, and um, I. Okay, let's talk about Idris Elba's character. I forgot his name. Kral. K- Kral or yeah, something. Kral. Yeah, so his backstory is that he was abandoned. I'm trying to recall what his motivation is because I, I, I wasn't too sure of it because he was mad that he had to go and make peace with the people he made war with, right? He fought in the war with. Yeah, so it's, and he's like, "Oh, that's unfair." It's revealed. That I don't understand that. <laughs> it's revealed that Kral is not actually an alien, and Kral is a human captain, and he is the captain of the USS Franklin, which is the ship that Jayla calls home, and which was thought to be lost hundreds of years ago. So, uh, this character, I think his name is Altazar, uh, or or Edison Ed- Edison Baltazar or something. And there's an Edison somewhere in there. And he and his crew are regarded as heroes, but in the meantime, he became obsessed with immortality or something. So the story of why he became evil is he was a warrior, he was a soldier, and after the army in the future was disbanded in favor of Starfleet, they made him a ship captain. So this is a whole thing about pacifism, and that didn't sit well with him. The idea of Star Trek is that it's a utopian future, so this is... A future where everyone is at peace in the world with each other, and we have a void. It ain't no Star Wars, I guess. Yeah, Sorry, that's that really lame. No, that 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 is true. It's the the whole idea is that Star Trek has always been about the best of what humanity can be, and this is reflected in the casting. During the sixties, it was completely radical to have a black woman on the cast. 
they have a Japanese man 20 years after the end of World War II, and they have a Russian character in the middle of the Cold War. So it's that's what it's about. The idea is that if you embrace conflict, then you don't fit in to the world. Mm. And this is a character mm. who embraces and needs conflict. Yeah. So I I don't mind that motivation, and I think it's a clever twist, but in the end, it's just a flip of the whole thing where there's so many stories where you think the character is human, but actually the character turns out to be alien, like in the first Man in Black, and any number of Martian Manhunter origin stories do that. So I yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I'm still trying to decide whether or not it was clever or was a bit too cute. Well, I mean, because I, I've seen him being compared as a Marvel villain, so I expected something much worse than that. But, you know, he had a clear motivation. He he wasn't just starving for power. He actually believed in something that made sense. So to, for me, it was he was an alright villain. He's not particularly re- memorable, but I was so distracted the moment Idris Elba came out on screen. I'm like, oh crap, that's Idris Elba. And then, yeah, it, it took me out of the movie. But the I don't the makeup I thought was really good because he did not look like Idris Elba. Honestly, I didn't find him scary at all. I think he did not look like Idris Elba, and I felt like that was a bit of a problem. You did mention this last week when I was talking about it, where you said in the Jungle Book, Shere Khan doesn't look like Idris Elba, but I felt that Shere Khan was so so much scarier than Kral, and I can't exactly put my finger on what it is. But it feels like his presence was tam- was dampened down, like he was trying to act through the makeup, and he had this very weird vocal affectation where it, it sounded like he had vampire teeth in, you know, this fake plastic vampire teeth you buy from a Halloween shop. It sounded like he was trying to talk through that. Yeah. And I don't know how much of his speech was an acting choice and how much of it was a hindrance of the prosthetics. Because I can't, I don't know where the line blurs. It, it, was, it was supposed to be scary, but there were points where the cadence sounded goofy. Well, I didn't really have that problem. I just thought that, you know, he was a villain. He was, I think he was scary in terms of how he could just, I don't, I guess it's the typical kind of he'll just kill anyone he sees. Like, I thought the, when he killed that one of the Starfleet members, I forgot her name, the one who hit that artifact. Oh, when he killed Syl, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that was like, oh, this guy is, this guy is nasty, you know? Yeah, like, that he, was he just brutal. kills indiscriminately, so... To me, I thought that was a little bit like, oh, that's kind of scary. But I mean, I guess a lot of villains do that. It's just that because we know a little bit about the character, very little, but you know that she's she's someone on on the staff. Oh, uh, sorry, she was someone on the Enterprise, and she she was willing to give up that artifact just to save Sulu or whatever, right? So like, there's something about her, like, okay, she she's a good person. And then you see her die the way she did, and it's like. It's kind of scary. Yeah, sort of death has meaning. Yeah, and and to me that that sort of gave that 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 made me fear the guy because you're fearing for the crew and what's gonna happen to the crew, even though we hardly know them, but you know that they're family, right? And like you've seen, because I thought the first part of the film did a really good job at humanizing the whole crew. Like, oh, they fall in love, they fall out of love, they have families that they have to go back to. And then, like, you see them just getting destroyed by this enemy. And you're like, oh my god, these are actual, well, they're not actual human beings, but in, in that world, they are, like, actual human beings, like, actual living creatures with who can love, who can, who have something to live for. And then it's just destroyed by this guy. So I think because of that, I like him as a villain because they made the Enterprise look look like actual people living inside and breathing together and trying to make the world a better place. If you get what I mean. And he's he's trying to destroy that, so... Mm, I don't know. It's just me, I guess. <laughs> like, I didn't think he was a bad villain at all. I thought he was an okay villain, and he was fearful, and, and I, I feared him enough to care about the characters and hope that they defeat him. I agree with what you're saying to the extent that I think his actions are fearsome. But I think that the personality of the character and as as a character, his presence, I was expecting more, especially from Idris Elba. And I think most of it can be chalked up to the fact that I was directly comparing him to Benedict Cumberbatch's Khan. And I felt that Benedict Cumberbatch was so magnetic, he really held down the center of Into Darkness. Everything flowed back to him, which is what ideally a villain should do as, as a hold the story as a center. And I guess 
there are moments where physically Kral is intimidating, and I really enjoyed the final fight in the zero gravity chamber with the ventilation shaft, and they were floating up and down, they were punching, they were flying through the slipstream. stream. I thought that was great stuff. But I think that they didn't there wasn't enough earlier on to establish there was enough to establish Kraus' threat to the Enterprise crew, but there wasn't enough to establish him as a character. Like everything we find out about him is the last act. Like it's it's really just a whole you you get his whole backstory and there isn't anything before the backstory. Do you, you get what I mean? Yeah, I do, I do. And I also like that they sort of pretended that they were gonna redeem him at, at the end, but he's like, no, he just takes that glass and tries to stab Kirk with it. Yeah. Like, did you think that he was gonna be like, oh man, I'm I'm a Starfleet member, and then he, he wants to help Kirk out? Or maybe, do you, do you feel that? Am I the only one who felt that? I think like, that the, the way they staged everything? I think they were trying to lead towards that. I think they were trying to faint in that direction. Yeah, so you yeah, definitely... I, I thought it was cool. Yeah, that was fun, and... His death, where the last thing that's left of him is the badge. That was a cool image. I, I thought that they should have lingered on the badge for one second longer. They faded too fast. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but yeah, on, on the whole, I feel that he's very much a villain who would show up in an episode of the TV show of the original series. So he's it's not a bad creation, but it feels it doesn't feel like someone substantial enough to be the villain for a movie. That's, mm, that's all. Okay, yeah. alright. I, I disagree with that, but... I well, it's alright. I can understand why you don't like him as a villain. His his reasonings are a little bit shallow, but I thought it was good enough for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like, even though I'm kind of sad that Uhura didn't have much to do, I'm glad that they toned down on the Spock and Uhura relationship. And I like that we, there was some sort of, you know, he gave her that that was it a pendant? Yes, I love that from I, his mom. They used that as a little plot device. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was cute because you know it's just like a because it could be it was used as a plot device, but at the same time it was also a sort of yeah that's what Vulcans do. He's a Vulcan, right? Yeah, he is half Vulcan. His mom's human. Yeah, half Vulcan. So I thought that was cute to show a little bit of that culture, but at the same time it was a callback in in the climax or not the climax near the climax of the film or the near near the second act. Oh, sorry, and, near the yeah, ending of the second and act. Second yeah. act. And I love how they're like, you gave her radiation as a gift. Something yeah, like Bones that. like, you gave your girlfriend radioactive jewelry. <laughs> and it's like, you gave <laughs> your girlfriend really a tracking device. <laughs> yeah. So good. I love I love that dialogue when they're thinking of what to do. Yeah, when they come out to rescue the, the team. And then Yeah, but And then like yeah, Zachary sorry. Quinto does this wonderful eyebrow raise. And he goes, That was not my intention. And it the deli- he nails the delivery. It's so funny. He's a really good spot. Yeah. yeah, he's probably like him and Carl Urban are the most perfect. I feel in terms of like casting for the spirit of the original characters. Yeah. Then and the oh. like earlier on when he's when he's with Uhura and he goes, it is not in the Vulcan custom. It is not in the Vulcan custom to receive what one has given as a gift. <laughs> and and the way they write the lines where it's a little bit pedantic and he's. He's got to go through all of the uh the he's he's got to be technical and he's got to be precise. I think that the dialogue is handled really well for all all the spot lines. Mm, yeah, I agree. Like I think Zachary Quinto is the most well not perfect. He he's the most perfect person you can find now for Spock. Yeah. He he does it so well and he also does the comedy as Spock super well. Yeah. And it's a good idea to contrast him with Bones because Bones is so direct. Yeah. And Spock isn't. Spock has to go through protocol. So you have both of them and there's a bit of a personality clash. <laughs> and that's where most uh, of them Alright, so you know the Star Trek theme? I really, really like it. They played it a lot in this film. Which one? Because there are several. Uh, It's the... Hang on, let me, let me try to remember it. Oh man, this, this is too hard. Is it the Kiachi no? Da, 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 yeah, yeah. Da, da. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Oh, that is so great. Like, Marco Giacchino good, is brilliant. Yeah. The score in this movie is wonderful. When they, they have that gorgeous, gorgeous establishing shot of Yorktown, and then you have a big sweep with the strings and all that. I was like, oh, I, that blew me away. That, I, I, that was what I was referring to last week when I talked about an establishing shot that I really enjoyed in this movie that made me feel... Oh, yes. Yeah. So you mean, like, you see the buildings, like, 
sort of on top of each other in a way. Yeah, when they when they flew oh, through Yorktown right. for the first time, and then they had this yes, great yes, big that score. Shot yeah. is amazing. Oh, lovely. And I love that you see you see the Enterprise like going through this glass window. Mm-hmm. That was really really cool. And something I found out a bit later is that Yorktown was actually the working name for the Enterprise in the first draft of Gene Roddenberry's script. So when he was writing Star Trek in the early days, he wanted to call the ship Yorktown. Okay, so that's all right. A cool little homage. Yeah, homage. Okay, so yeah, amazing theme. Played a li- I think they played it a little bit too much, but I still love the theme nonetheless. And I, I really like uh, when they. Sorry, <laughs> when they went to the when when they went back to the. The theme of the movie starring the original cast when Spock opened the box and you saw, I mean, oh, yeah, when you, and when you saw the yes. photo of the Ralph Khan era cast, which was brilliant. I completely was not expecting that, and I think that was so classy. It was really, really cool. It was so beautiful, yes. It was so, so beautiful. Did everyone gasp and in your hall? No, no. I don't. Like, Nobody I was <laughs> I was in a theater with, well, I think there was one Star Trek fan at the back. Oh, okay. I'm not a Star Trek fan, by the way. I'm just, I'm just a casual viewer. So, um... My theater had almost no one. I have no idea why. Oh, all right. I guess it was a very isolated cinema, so that's why no one was there. But, um, yeah, no one really reacted much. I guess a few laughs here and there, but it was a very quiet crowd. I was reacting a lot to this movie. <laughs> I I really got into it, and there there's some there's some jokes that are so subtle. There's one that that kind of impresses me. Okay, so. Scotty is speculating about what happens to the USS Franklin, and he says that it may have been a giant green space hand. Yes, I heard of that. Yeah, so I I've heard of that um that reference. So it, only because I watch a video. Sorry, it's not it's not because I'm a Star Trek fan, <laughs> unfortunately. And during the end credits, like the main on end titles, you see a giant green space hand when they are flying through the nebula, showing the credits and names come up. There's very briefly a yeah. giant green space hand floating in space, and I thought that was pretty funny. And and it also appeared in one of the TV series, I think. Yeah, I yeah, I'm I not yeah I'm not a Star thing. Trek scholar. Like I'm a fan of the new movies, but I don't know very. Yeah, much I'm a fan of the movies. Too. Um. Okay, so let's just end it here. It was it was a good movie. Oh, uh, and, let's see. Yeah. I have a few more things to talk about. I like the uniforms. They reminded me very much of the X Men first class flight suits. The blue and yellow things, and Greg Grunberg has a cameo, okay, so he's the guy, he's a bit of a large man, and he's in the lookup point, so when the bees are attacking Yorktown, he's the guy who gives the commands, so he was also in The Force Awakens, he's like a good friend of J.J. Abrams's, and he's been in all of his stuff, he's the guy from Heroes, uh, and he was actually the voice of Kirk's dad on the car phone. In Star Trek. Oh, okay. Design. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. All right, all right. So now we finally get yeah, to yeah. see him physically appear in a Star Trek movie. <laughs> yeah. What else is there? Oh, Kirk jumping off the ramp and grabbing Jayla, and they're both beamed out. That's Furious Six with Dom and Letty flying off the bridge. <laughs> I don't remember Furious Six. I hardly remember <laughs> the Furious movies. They are just. They are sort of like Transformers to me, but I know it's not that bad. Oh, yeah, but they, are, they, they really are equivalent to Transformers for me. I just cannot remember them, but I remember not having a good time. I love the opening so much, where they do that trick and then they reveal the perspective and they're actually really tiny. Yes. They're so funny. Well, I mean, yeah. my my company, they actually did that scene. Oh, cool. So, so I, I was kind of spoiled. So, you knew, before, the, so. you knew the twist with the T-Max opening. Yeah. Oh, can you tell us a little yeah. bit about what scenes you worked on for this movie? So I think, well, I didn't do the whole thing, but, I mean, my company didn't do the whole thing, but we did the first scene that you talked about, Mm -hmm. we did the Jayla fighting scene, we did the entire scene where they're trying to rescue the crew, and I'm pretty sure they did the climax at the end, but I never did anything for the climax, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the the visual effects work in this movie is brilliant, it's really, really good. I, I was looking for bits where the CGI did not mesh or felt a little, didn't have weight, but I couldn't find anything. I was re- I, I liked all of the visual effects stuff. I think it really, really worked. The creature things in the beginning were kind of eh, but <laughs> I, I, I like shouldn't it. say that. <laughs> because because <laughs> they, they're, they're the next stuff. The, but I mean, it, it'll age. It'll honestly age. It will, that, I that suppose. Character yeah. animation, but you know, it, it's good for what it is now. The destruction of the Enterprise had a lot of weight. I felt that you really, you really mm. felt the pain of it tearing apart. You know? 
I, I love how long that scene felt. Yes. Because it's just so painful to watch and they just they just held on to that pain and you're just like, oh God, this is just going to get worse. And I love the part where they cut off the head or the tail or whatever and it's just so sad to see that happen. Yeah. It's like a boxing match where you're going so many rounds and you're pummeling you and you're on the road. like, no mass, no mass. And that's what it felt like. It it was it was really a good idea to draw that out because just as you said, you feel the pain. You know what's going to happen at the end. It's just, they, they make it so much worse because you're just waiting for it to happen. Yeah, and oh, I, I, I love that... Uh, the time lapse ending with them rebuilding the Enterprise, and then how for space the final frontier they had each character say each line, which I don't think has ever been done before. And oh, uh, yeah. it was so sad to hear like Anton yeah, and yeah to, yeah to hear Anton Yelchin go, you new civilizations, and yeah, it's <laughs> Captain, we are standing on a very very large bomb. <laughs> Oh, uh, you don't make me miss him. Yeah, it's, uh, so I I I feel so sad. And yeah, like when his name came out at the end of the credits, he's too young, man. It's it's, it's terrible, but oh, that was that was such a that was so heartbreaking when I was in loving memory of Leonard Nimoy and for and Todd. I was like, no, no, why? Well, yeah, for I mean, do you? I mean, it's it's horrible. Do you think they're gonna do like Fast and Furious Eight? Where I forgot who said it. Um. Uh, Fast and Furious 7 was for Paul <laughs> and then Fast and Furious 8 is from going Paul. to be by Paul from, oh, from Paul. Paul yeah Vin Diesel said that <laughs> so they are receiving script pages from heaven floating down <laughs> it's like okay that is Fast and Furious in a nutshell it doesn't make sense but yeah. just go with it yeah and it's meant to be sentimental too which makes it so much worse for me to laugh at it when I first heard it I know yeah but holy crap the next movie has two Oscar winners <laughs> Uh, but one of them doesn't care. She said it in the Graham Norton show. There's no acting in this, right? <laughs> oh, I love her. Helen Mirren. Helen Mirren. I can't wait, yeah. I mean, like, I love Helen Mirren a lot in Red. So I think she's going to bring the same thing to this one. I think Charlie Theron will be, like, doing her best for some reason. It'll be Furiosa. <laughs> yeah. It'll be Furiosa's the bad like, guy, she did, yeah. Like, she did... She was so... She was so good in Snow White and the Huntsman. And you're like, what are you doing? It's just a stupid film. Don't do that. And she's wasting all her energy on that film. But she was amazing in the first She film. made it all the Okay, but anyway. Yeah, okay. So let us... Yeah, let, let's go on to news because we have so many yeah, news. We've because got, it's Comic Con. It's Comic Con, yeah. In the mouth of madness. So, all right. Let's dive so, in hit first. All right. Let's just start with the simpler one first. Lego Batman trailer. What do you think of it? Did you see it? <laughs> I did. That was fun. Okay, I think they've got the tone right, and I know a lot of people were concerned about Seth Graham Smith writing, but the writing is really funny, and I I love the design of Dick Grayson where he looks like Carrie Kelly, and they give him these ridiculous glasses, and somehow Michael Sarah doesn't sound so wrong. I couldn't tell what's Michael Sarah. Which is good. But I huh. I have to disagree with you when you say that it's funny because I had a heart. I don't know. It's it's that kind of humor. Where they're trying to be funny, but it's not. Like, you can tell that they're trying to, so hard to be funny. So, you know Cloudy? I love Cloudy, who's also written by Phil Lord and Chris Cloudy Nella. of a Chance of Meatballs, yeah. Yeah, Cloudy of a Chance of Meatballs. And then the second one came out, and it tries to go for the same type of humor, but it just doesn't work. And I don't know why. I guess the charm isn't there. And I feel like this is this is going to be the same thing for this Little Go Batman film. Um, I mean, I did laugh at some parts, like how he ripped off the pants, so it looked like yeah. classic Robin. And I love Dick Grayson, and he's he's so sexy, I'm sorry, but he really is. So it's kind of sad to see him this way. It's a really, really funny bit where... The, the bit that I laugh the most at is probably the reveal that Bruce Wayne didn't even know he adopted Dick Grayson, and he thought he was being sarcastic. Mm. And yes. yeah, this because I think the characterization is very consistent with Lego Batman, where this is like he's conceited and he's an asshole and he thinks he's the greatest. And it's really, really funny to see that Batman and Will Arnett suits that Batman very much. So I'm glad they're continuing on with that. Yeah, I, I have no problem with well, I kinda do with their take on Dick Grayson, but I kinda I just wish he's he was just Robin and not a specific Robin? No, I think that this is yeah, that this 
they're hoping that this will be a franchise. They're hoping that there'll be many, many Lego Batman movies. So they're starting with him getting on, taking on the first sidekicks. So this is Dick Grayson and okay. Barbara, Barbara Gordon. So from there, hopefully we will get... <laughs> It'll be very funny to see Lego Red Hood and see how they do that. <laughs> and yeah. I'm sure they did uh, They they did that in in the games. I just forgot how. He actually had guns, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. I think there are characters with guns in the games, but it's 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 quite funny because the Lego Batman games are the only games where you can kill people as Batman. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. They burst okay. into little pieces, but they come back together. <laughs> yeah, uh yeah, so, so that that looks like fun. Like of course Ray finds You know let's okay. let's let's rate the trailer. So Oh, I, I don't have anything fun. Alright, just yay or nay. Mm, yeah, I'm. 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 I. I think I'll enjoy this because it has been described as kind of like ninety minutes of an Easter egg, ninety minutes, a uh, ninety minute long robot chicken episode, and like I. See, un- unfortunately, I'm not a fan of that kind of humor. I like more story, um, humor. I mean, story driven humor, as opposed to fan service. So it. I don't think it's made for me. I see where you're coming from, but I feel like with a property like Batman, especially for someone like me who has loved Batman for so long, I don't mind it being 90 minutes of like a satirical tour through the history of the character. And I think that if you're going to do that with the Lego Batman franchise, and that's a good counterpoint because you have a dark, serious Batman in the DC Cinematic Universe, but then you also have this running alongside. And I like that. I think that there's a Batman for all seasons. And Batman is a very malleable, very resistant character, very resilient character. So he, it's open to many different interpretations. Batman 66 is as valid as the Dark Knight trilogy, whatever, you, yep. you know, whatever your tastes are. So I like the idea of this. Okay. Well, it, I'll say nay for this okay. because I just don't like the humor and it feels like it's trying so hard to be funny that it just isn't working for me. Yeah, then, then I do have a feeling that you probably won't like the whole thing. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. Because, like, I mean, the first time I watched, I, I didn't watch any of the Lego movie trailers until I saw it on the big screen. And the first thing that came up, like, I was just laughing like crazy because of the Lego movie trailer. And this one, I was just, hmm, you know, like, all right, that's that's quite smart. That's quite you funny. You a bit of air out of your nose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's, I, but my favorite gag is you him ripping off the pants. Oh yeah, and like shoving his butt. I don't I didn't like face. what came after that though, which is like him, you know, showing his yeah, butt he off. Shoved his butt that was a little bit lame. Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay, so next one, let's go for Wonder Woman trailer. Oh my gosh, this made me so happy. This made me really, really, really happy. This was a dream come true. This everything I was hoping it would be. We have always wanted to see a Wonder Woman solo film. And Wonder Woman is one of those characters where her origin story is not well known by the general public. It's not like Superman, Batman, or Spider-Man. So it's logical to go back and do an origin story. And what we saw of Themyscira, it felt right to me. What we saw of Diana on the island, that felt right to me. Her fighting style in this movie looks amazing. The way that she uses the sword, the shield, and the lasso. And the use of slow motion, the bullet time. I thought it would be cheesy, but it looked great. I think the historical element, I hope they use it well. It looks quite authentic. The beach uh, battles and the whole running through no man's land, that actually looks pretty cool. And World War One is underused as a historical setting, mostly because you don't have the really, really easy bad guys of the Nazis. World War One is a lot more complicated than World War Two. Yeah. So I'm curious to see how they handle that. I think Chris Pine is pitch perfect for Steve Trevor. He's exactly what oh, I... Oh, sh- okay. Hang on. Before you, uh, he should have been, um, I won't say Hal Rodnick. Uh, he Hell should have Jordan. been Hal Jordan. Yeah, I know. I'm so upset over that, but okay, continue. Hal Jordan and Steve Trevor are very much alike at the beginning point, at the starting point. So that's why Nathan Fillion has played both of them. And uh, yeah, I, I, he was up for Captain America before Chris Evans got it. So it would have been from Captain Kirk to Captain America. So this is, mm-hmm. yeah, I always mix up. And Chris up. Hemsworth and Thor will be his dad. Exactly, right? Yeah, that would have been weird. <laughs> I I always mix up Steve Trevor and Steve Rogers in my head. As, yep, yeah, me too. Because they are basically the same character. I think he's got that charming dashing thing going for him. We don't know anything basically about the villains from this first trailer, which is very curious. So I, I do want to find out more about the villains. We see a bit of Danny Houston, 
and we see a woman with an artificial like jaw plate. I think that's supposed to be Elena and Aya, and we don't know what's mm. going on with them. So hopefully we'll find out more about the bad guys. But so far, it made me really really happy. Yeah, I I really enjoyed this too. It reminded me a little bit of Zack Snyder's action style with the bullet time and slow mo. But I love that you can see colors in this film. I think the the color palettes in this film look amazing. Yeah, and it's not just dark. There's actually like some artistic take on it, which is really really cool. And I love that it's set in World War One. I, I, I like you. I think that World War One is just not. It's not used, like. It, it's not used often, and I think World War One is such an interesting setting as well. Mainly because, like you said, there's no, there's no true, like, there's no Germans in this. Or I mean, there is, there are Germans. They're no but Nazis. They're no they're easy. Not the, they are easy pop. Yeah, members. they're no easy bad guys yeah. to be like. Oh, Nazis are terrible. So this is this is great. I love the setting. I love that it takes place years before Men of Steel. So it it's a different time, and it doesn't. It probably won't feel the same, right? I doubt it. And I love that one shot with her in that beautiful blue dress, mm-hmm. like, and how how she sticks out among the crowd. And then like you give you sorry, they cut to a shot at her back, and then you see her with a sword. Yeah. I thought that was so freaking cool. She she looks like a badass. But man, this trailer it's really good. But I'm kind of worried because a lot of Zack Snyder films they look amazing, and I know this is not a Zack Snyder film, but it looks good enough to be a Zack Snyder film. And I just hope that there's a lot more substance to it besides looking super cool and super awesome. And I do like the little humor that we get from this film. Yeah. Which is the Zeus part. Chris Pine, he's really funny. He does a good I think he can do comedy yeah. very well. And yeah, I, I'm i still not sold on her... What, what's her name? Gal Gadot. Yeah, I'm not sold on her being Wonder Woman yet. She didn't impress me in Batman v Superman, mainly because she wasn't in it that oh, much, so it's not her fault. It's, yeah, you're definitely a minority there, I, I think. There are still a lot of people who don't like her as Wonder Woman, but when I watched this trailer, I had zero problems with it. Like, there are trailers where I watch it and I'm not convinced on the casting yet, and I watch the trailer and I go, I don't know. But with this one, I, I surrendered to it, and I don't know whether that's because I'm that much of a DC person and I love the character and I'm attached to the character. But I didn't see Gal Gadot, I just saw the character, I just saw Wonder Woman. And mm, okay. I actually did not know that they were going to have Etta Candy in the film. So when they revealed at the end of the trailer that Etta Candy was going to be in it, I, I, I squeed. I was so excited. I was like, Etta Candy's in the movie! That means they're sticking close enough to the source material that they are pulling this character from the early days of the book. And they're keeping her, you know, the physique that she is. They didn't make her skinny. There's some adaptations where Etta Candy is really skinny, which loses the point of the character. She's um, she's gonna be dead though by the time Man of Steel comes. So yeah, everybody is. Pet, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like Bucky and friends, and we're in Captain America. I like the director of this film, even though I only saw one of her films, which is Monsters, right? Monster, yeah, with Charlie. That's the one that yeah, Charlie Monster. Starren won her Oscar for. Yeah, I really like that film, so I hope. I hope this film does well. It's a huge jump though from a small film like that to a big film like this. But hopefully she she doesn't get bullied by the studio. Yeah, but I from what I've seen, I buy the film. I say yay for this trailer. But I hope I I'm not completely sold on Wonder Woman as a film. But I hope it convinces me. I'm so it's it's the whole Batman v Superman thing. I was so excited for that film. I'm just I don't want to be you know once bitten twice shy. Oh, I think Batman v Superman. I I I think that it's one of those movies where you have to you you have to give it a second chance and the, the other thing is that I feel I feel that DC knows what happened. They know that people didn't react positively to it and they're doing damage control and they are ex- assessing how they're moving forward and I think that the outcome or the fallout of Batman v Superman will very much affect how they move forward with Wonder Woman and with the rest of the movies. I think they're learning and another thing is, okay. I think, here's here's why I think they would treat Patty Jenkins well. Because she was booted off Thor 2. So here's what I think mm. happened. I think Warner went to them and said, we won't treat you the way Marvel did. And she said, alright. So that is okay. that is probably the why she would say yes to it. If she was given a better deal, or if she was shown more respect than Marvel showed her. Okay, yeah, yeah. 
Man, thought it was a snooze fest. <laughs> okay. Um. Next up, we have. So, next up, we have Justice League. Yeah. Sort of a trailer. It's more like a teaser. Yeah, it's guess, a presentation. Because they don't have that deal. much. Yeah. yeah, they don't have that much to show because of. Because they're still filming, if I'm not wrong. So that's it's nice of them to show something at least. Yep, it's just like what did you think? Yeah, just like when they were still filming Batman v Superman, the thing they showed us was him standing on the roof with the bat symbol, uh, the bat signal. So this is the equivalent of that. What did I think? Uh, to me, it felt very much like a guy was going around putting together a band. <laughs> it was like, do you play bass? Okay, now we need a keyboardist. You on drums? Can we? Hear Reminded you? me a little bit of X Men First Class. Oh yeah, yeah. And then Wolverine says, "Go app yourself." <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a very good point. So I like the humor in it. I think that the way they made it a bit lighter didn't feel like a betrayal of the tone. It didn't feel like we're completely jumping to Marvel. It felt quite organic. Yeah, the banter that they had back and forth, like and Wonder Woman and Batman together. I I hope they they have more of that like i don't think they should necessarily pursue a romantic pairing but i've always liked seeing wonder woman and batman work off of each other basically from justice league from the animated series and i think that the bit where they're talking where they're just casually sitting in front of the computer and talking to each other that worked (laughs) yeah it worked very well and i think okay so i'm a huge fan of the flash series Obviously, not a big fan enough to actually finish watching this season two. Yeah, I exactly. will eventually <laughs> once I get a time, once I find time to watch it. But um, I this Barry Allen didn't feel very Barry Allen to me. I'm not sure how this character is supposed to be portrayed because I only know him from the TV series and from the Flashpoint movie and whatever I I saw on Wikipedia. So I've never read a single one of his comics before, and it felt a little bit like Civil War Spider Man oh, than yeah. it did. Barry Allen because he's so young he doesn't feel like someone who has a job in the police academy or something that's a good point it did feel a little bit like Tony going to recruit Spider-Man well I think Ezra Miller is still the biggest question mark for everybody because everyone is kind of like okay now we have a feeling of what Ben Affleck and Gal Gadot Henry Cavill and Jason Momoa are going to be but we don't really know what Flash is going to be we don't really know what Cyborg is going to be and Flash people are more skeptical because there is already a Flash TV series ongoing. I think Ezra Miller is actually not that young. I'm gonna Google his age right now. It's He's about twenty three, I bet. Ah, uh, let's see. How old is Ezra Miller? Yeah, you're right. He's he's twenty four, twenty three, twenty four. So he's a little bit older than Tom Holland in Civil War, yeah, but he does feel kind of young to be a CSI. Like he definitely feels younger than Grant Gustin. Yeah, he really does. But like, I, I, I thought he was fine. I thought like his line deliveries were really good. I guess it, this is sort of a, I have to get used to this Barry Allen. And it's much better than seeing Batman kill people. So it's it's alright. Like, I like him. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, I like Ezra Miller a lot in this. I'm not sure whether I like him as Barry Allen, but... I liked him. He's funny, and I think Cyborg looked really cool. Mm-hmm. I love Cyborg. I only know him from Teen Titans, but it's really nice to see that character. I love his backstory so much. Yep. So it's really nice to see that character because he 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 represents like the handicap, right? And how you shouldn't you shouldn't you're you're not you you still have value despite your disabilities, and he makes use of that. And I think he's a great representation for young kids or people who have experienced something terrible in their lives and he's he's great man like i love cyborg as a character and it's just so nice to see him be a justice league member even though a lot of people hate that yeah there are there are a lot of stories where you hear of people with very promising careers in sports and then they have a career ending injury and what happens so the ultimate extreme of that is cyborg he's a star football player and then he gets caught in the accident and his life is completely destroyed but what happens after that so I am looking forward to seeing how that will be done. And also Ray Fisher is an unknown quantity. He has not been in any movie before Batman v Superman. So he's probably the least known. He is definitely the least known of the Justice League actors. With Barry Allen, I feel that the change in the hairstyle (laughs) made a lot of difference for me. Because seeing him with a man bun and the stubble going on in that grocery store CCTV scene, convenience store CCTV scene in Batman vs. Superman, I was like, eh, that doesn't look like Barry Allen. But seeing him a bit more clean cut in this one, I felt, okay, I could give that a go. I still think 
I would like Barry to be blonder because I, I feel that that's kind of important. I think Barry is at the intersection of nerd and junk. He's like, yeah, yeah that's that's who he is in the comics. So we'll see okay. what they do with that. He's Grand definitely Gustin the comic is, is relief. Adorable. Sorry. Yeah, I, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I love Grand Gustin. I will. I promise to to watch season two. Yeah, Grand Gustin Gustin is he's so adorable and he can carry a show much much better than Stephen Amell can. Sorry, sorry, Stephen Amell, but he can carry. But yeah, that's yeah, alright. I I feel the same way too. Such a better actor. <laughs> so much more charismatic. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, and and I I love Jason Momoa as um, as Aquaman. I think he looks really badass. Also, don't know much about his character except that he threw a polar bear at some fisherman. <laughs> so that's cool. I I yeah. love I love the line where he literally goes slow. I heard you talk to fish. <laughs> yes. Uh, that was funny. Yeah, there there are little bits of several trailers. We'll get to the Doctor Strange trailer later, but there are some jokes in these trailers which I didn't expect, and I still can't decide whether the jokes are funny or whether it's just that I was that taken aback that I laughed. <laughs> For Justice League? Yeah, for ju- and for some of the other I laughed more in Justice League than I did for the Lego Batman trailer. So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this film, even though it is a Zack Snyder film. And I should be wary, but... Well, I don't know. Um, But it really looks like a huge improvement in terms of tone over Batman v Superman. But at the same time, I like that it still has that dark feeling to it, like something terrible is going to happen. Yeah, so... And it, it feels different enough from Marvel and whatever they are doing. The most promising thing about this clip, this sizzle reel for me, is that it shows they're going to give the characters time to get to know each other. They're not going to slam them together in a rush and get done with it. They're going to build the team a little bit. They're going to take their time with it. And that's why they're splitting it into parts one and two. So I'm happy that there is a recruitment process. There is them getting to know each other. And there probably will be them like refining their technology or building the watchtower or something. I need that stuff because... We all love it in Iron Man, in the first Iron Man where Tony Stark builds the tech. And I think that there should be more superhero movies which give us time to breathe, which give us time to see things come together. And then it's more satisfying when it does. I don't think Justice League is split into two anymore. I, I think it still is, right? Is it is it not split into two? I don't think so. I remember there was like some backlash and then this one of the representatives came up and said, oh, we're just doing one. So... Hmm, okay, yeah, I, I feel that, I think that, yeah, if it's if it's not split into two, I don't know whether they're going to rush and put whoever the villain from the second one will be into the first one, or whether they're just going to proceed ahead, but that will be an important thing, whether or not they are rushing. Besides, besides, um, what's the, Suicide Squad, the one movie I'm really looking forward to for DC is that Cyborg and Flash movie. I heard it's going to be a super fun, like, buddy cop. Well, not buddy cop, but more like a... I guess it is buddy cop, right? Yeah, Have kinda. you heard of that? Yeah, I'm, I'm so looking forward to that. And I think those two... Maybe they'll develop a little bit of their relationship in Justice League, so that's something that we also need to make sure that hopefully they, they pace it out well. Yeah, and you, you've got... So it's the classic pairing of the big guy and the fast guy. So that'll be... I, I think... I think maybe they age down uh the flash because of that. So, so that, that he has he can interact with, with Cyborg. Cyborg. Yeah. I I can yeah. see that. And I think the Flash has always been something of a youthful presence. He's always definitely younger than Superman or Batman. And he he came off that way in Justice League as well, where they were using the Wally West version, but they also used bits of Barry Allen's backstory. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Go on. Um Okay, so I'm looking it up right now. There, it won't be a part two, but it's still a sequel. So there will still be a second Justice League movie, but it probably won't be Zack Snyder. So they're letting him do this one, but then because of the backlash, they're taking him off part two, but there still will be a part two. Okay. Yeah, so that I, I think it's it's a bit foggy, but I think that's what they're doing. They're trying to make a compromise. They're trying to say, I still think it was a terrible idea to get Zack Snyder because he's such a controversial director. But that's just me. I think he did a great job on Man of Steel. I've yet to watch Batman v Superman, The Ultimate Cut, which is, you know, his vision. Yeah. So, Justice League. I'm. This is another one that has been so long in the works. So, I really hope they don't mess it up. And what I'm seeing of it looks encouraging. And I like that Batman actually feels a lot less angry. 
in this one. It looks like he's about to start most of his issues, and he's kind of cool. He's he's kind of chill. <laughs> he's getting along yeah, with people, is. and he's being friendly to people, and he's making fun of people, and it's like ah, oh, that's nice. <laughs> he learned a lot um, from from this character growth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really cool. I I really enjoyed it, and uh, one thing to take note of is also Cyborg of uh, what's his character Victor. Big Stone. Victor Stone, yeah, he's actually from Gotham City University, so that's a new change. Mm, cool, yeah. If you see his school jacket, yeah, so that's something to take note of. Uh, alright, let's talk about Batman for a while. It is, an, well, there's a rumor that says that Batman could be taking place in Arkham Asylum. So if you're familiar with the Arkham Asylum game, it's basically like the same plot where he gets trapped in Arkham Asylum and he has to work his way out. So that's his first solo Batman film. Or at least that's the rumoured one. And it seems consistent with the rumours that we hear that it's going to be an an original comic. I guess it's original, right? Yeah. Has there been a comic where he was stuck in Arkham Asylum? Kind of. Serious House. He has to work his way out. Serious House and Serious Earth is a little bit like that. Yeah. Okay. But uh, that's Uh. a Grant Morrison graphic novel. So that's not really like a traditional comic book. And that one is very trippy. It's actually really creepy, that book. (laughs) Okay. I'll check that out. I've never heard of that before. So, um, yeah. And what do you like this direction that they're going with the new solo Batman? I I personally love it because it's it sounds so self contained, and that's what I want from a Batman film. I think that makes a lot of sense because what happens is when you trap Batman in Arkham Asylum, you have a clear objective, but you also have boundless opportunities for cameos for Easter eggs. And it reminds me a little bit of that script that was floating around Green Arrow Supermax, which they were going to make before the Arrow TV series and all of that came out, which is Ollie is thrown into a prison with everybody else. And you see, you have cameos on Max Luthor, you have cameos on the Joker. And it's all of the supervillains yeah. of the... Yeah, so it, it reminds me of that in concept. And the Arkham Asylum game is brilliant. That broke the mm-hmm. curse of bad Batman video games or bad comic book video games. And that created a really successful... A video game universe when people thought that licensed characters are killer. If you make any video game with a licensed character, it's just a cash in. You can't do anything original with it. Also, the yeah. yeah sorry, I, I'm cutting you off. Go ahead. I, I'm just agreeing with you. Uh, thanks. Sorry. The one of the major influences of the Arkham Asylum game is Escape from New York, and that is a great template. I think if you put if you throw Batman in the middle of that, that's cool. The only issue with this is that. You have a real-time story. It, you really have to play the tension up. And then you cannot have Batman go back to the... We can't be into the cave. You cannot have him go back and meet with Alfred. Which I kind of want. I want in the middle of a Batman movie for him to go back to the cave. So he won't be able to do that if he's trapped in Arkham for the whole story. Well, in the game, he has a bad cave in sight, Arkham Asylum. So uh, they could use the same idea. Yeah, but Alfred won't be there. Yeah. Alfred will be at the at Bat Cave Central, which is the main thing. Still, that, that's a cool idea. Yeah, and... That means they will have to cast everyone. They'll have to cast Two Face, Poison Ivy, all the villains, and I'm excited. So, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of disappointed because I mean I I love the idea and I'm I'm all for this idea, but I'm still kind of sad that we won't be able to see like people like Oracle or Nightwing, you know the good guys. So oh, but but um. Uh, Commissioner Gordon is going to be in it, which makes sense, I guess. Yep. He's probably going to escort. Oh, man. It's going to be this, isn't it? This is going to be the first solo Batman film. It sounds oh, I'm like up, it. I'm up for it. Like, it, it sounds like a ton of fun. It sounds like Batman is going to kick a lot of ass. And I hope he uses his detective work to get out of the asylum. Yeah, and in the, the very opening of the game, the opening cinematic where he drives Joker to Arkham Asylum, they unload him, and then he walks into the asylum and he sees Gordon and they shake hands. That is great, because the way that Handshake is animated, there's just a lot of trust there, and you see that this is a routine. And I think that the relationship between Gordon and Batman in the Arkham games is so similar to the relationship in Batman the Animated Series, and I really like how they built upon it. Yeah, because the, I'm pretty sure they said that the Arkham games were inspired by the, 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 the animated Series, yeah, right? because it's the same writer. Paul Dini worked on the yeah, on Arkham Asylum okay. and he created... Why don't you just get this guy to write every single Batman film? He's a good writer. That's what people have been saying. And he saying. has great stories. I think he's actually yeah. with Marvel now, if I'm not wrong. He's oh. Oh, with, with Marvel. Oh, like He's sucks. working on a TV series for Marvel. But, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, it would be... Everyone has said that they should have Paul Dini write 
the solo Batman film. We'll see what happens. I think it's still Ben Affleck and Jeff Johns to write it. So Jeff Johns is also the co-writer of the Wonder Woman movie. So, oh, to go back to Wonder Woman, I need to pick your brain. Like, what do you feel about the reveal that it's men who wrote the Wonder Woman script, that there are no females? I, I, I do not care. Cool. As long as it's a good story, that's all I want. I mean, it's nice if women wrote it, but women should write other stuff as well. Like, I, I don't think that women should just be writing for women. I think women should write for, you know, movies with with male leads and not just female leads. And if we are so caught up on the fact that men are writing for women, then... Women should we write for men not, as well, right? Back, yeah. yeah, yeah, like, then we... Then people can counter uh, with it by saying, hey, how come women can't write for men? And, I mean, we are improving in terms of representation, but men are still dominating the industry. Oh, and I don't think it's... I don't think it's fair that female writers have to wait for females to rise up mm-hmm. before they can write for them. Yeah, so I, I'm okay with men writing for Wonder Woman and... And I just hope that female writers get a write for male leads one day. Yeah, that's a very solid argument. Then I think so far we've had Nicole Perlman who wrote Guardians of the Galaxy, but that was like James Gunn did a, a did a retake on it. So she's, if I'm not wrong, she's the only female writer who has done a Marvel Cinematic Universe film so far. I hope they give it to other female writers too. I bet I bet Captain Marvel is probably gonna have a female writer because she's female. Yeah, Captain Marvel whatever. is Nicole Perlman. <laughs> so it's it's the woman who wrote Guardians of the Galaxy together with Meg Lafave, oh, okay. who was one of the screenwriters of Inside Out. Oh, alright, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. It is a cool combination. Okay, so what's next on the agenda? Uh right, since we talked about Captain Marvel, let's go on to Brie Larson being officially announced as Said character Captain Marvel. Yeah, so we have yet another Oscar winner in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yep. I have I don't know much about Captain Marvel. In fact I know nothing about her at all, except my version of Captain Marvel is that he's a kid who says Shazam, Shazam and yeah. then he becomes like Superman, but that's not Captain Marvel. That's Shazam now. <laughs> because this Captain Marvel took away that name. So yeah. well, whatever. Sorry, it's, I'm so bitter about it's it. It's very difficult for Billy Batson to find out what song is playing in public. I know, Shazam! Uh, <laughs> it doesn't make sense that his name is Shazam, but whatever. There is a whole trope called oh, My Name are Is you? Not... I mean, oh, I'm Shazam, and then he becomes a My kid My name again. is not Shazam. Sorry. And now that has a bit over it. Yeah, the Captain Marvel naming thing is hilarious. Anyway, the character of Captain Marvel... You know the character of Star Sapphire, right? Of uh, Carol Ferris. Nope. The main like girlfriend of of uh, Hal Jordan, she's the pilot. And oh, she okay, gets yeah, yeah. Basically that. Okay. Yeah, she's a she's a test pilot, and then she has a DNA in experiment spliced in with alien pre alien DNA, so she gains superpowers as a result. And Captain Marvel is mostly a cosmic character, so most of her adventures take place in space. And we've also had her crossover with the Guardians of the Galaxy several times. Okay. Yeah, so they're taking like it. Fun. They're taking it further into the cosmic realm. Okay, cool. I'm. I can't wait for this. I love Brie Larson, and I'm glad that she's going to be in a big known property. Yeah, definitely. The first time I was ever exposed to her was in Twenty One Jump Street, and I'm. It's pretty cool to see her, you know, just rise up like that. Yeah, and she's been in a lot of comedy TV shows, and she's got very solid dramatic shots as well. Like anyone who has seen Room or Short Term Twelve can attest. With yeah. the character of Cal Danvers, I actually really, really wanted. Yvonne Strawski, and I've been championing that for a long, long time, but it did not happen. Who? Oh, well. <laughs> cool. Yvonne Strawski is the lead from Chuck, and oh, yeah, okay, the blonde lady, okay, the Australian woman, yep. yeah. And I think a lot of people wanted Katie Sackhoff, but Katie Sackhoff is a little bit obvious. Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Okay, so do you wanna? Is that all? I I can't really contribute to this. All I can say is that I like Brie Larson. I'm glad she's getting work. Yeah, I can't contribute to it very much either. But we'll have to see whether or not they're tying the story into Agents of Shield because Agents of Shield has the Kree aliens as a plot device, and the Kree aliens are where Captain Marvel derives her power from. So I don't know how much continuity there's going to be in that regard, or if they're going to change her origin. You know what else pisses me off about Captain Marvel, the DC one? So they have The Rock playing Black Black Adam. Yeah. Right? 
no one else can can match The Rock. I'm so sad that he's not Captain Marvel. <laughs> but okay, let's go on to the next you one, which is Doctor kid. Strange. Like, yeah. yeah, you need a, well the only the only person I can Terry see Cruz, matching his it. charisma is Terry Crews. <laughs> so he's not gonna be. I I highly doubt they're gonna ever get Terry Crews to do it. So. Yeah. Man, that that film, I have no idea what they're planning for it, but okay, never mind. Anyway, Doctor Strange trailer. Yeah. What did you think of it? I think it's it's pretty cool. It's more of uh it's very much in line with the first trailer and they don't give very much more away. You do get to hear Max Mickelson speak finally. And I think that Benedict Cumberbatch's American accent is flawless. It really throws me for a loop. This is really, really good. Like, a lot of British actors trip up with their American accents, but I love his American accent. I think it's really, really nice. <laughs> I guess that there's a bit of a problem where the main image of your movie and the main image of your trailer is the one from Inception, that you're already taking something that has been ingrained in popular culture from something else, and then you're borrowing it and appropriating it. Like, Okay, for sure, Inception was not the first movie or first piece of media to have a city fold in on itself. I'm sure there's an anime somewhere that has done that already. But I find that it's a little bit of a letdown that this is what Doctor Strange is hedging the visuals on. Because the other visuals yeah. in the trailer are really cool. All the hex stuff and the teleportation and him like making crystal wall. All that stuff is nice, but the one thing that people will remember is the image that you borrowed from Inception. I agree with you. Honestly, I had no idea what was happening in this trailer, but it looked cool. I think we saw the scene where they're like jumping, you know, the gif? Yeah, <laughs> and then they, yeah. they photoshop everybody in. They're running down the street yes. in London, yeah. <laughs> I think we saw that. I think the shot was inside. Yeah, right? it like, was. Or at least the shot that was leading up to that shot. So that was really fun to see. Yeah. And I agree with you on the Inception thing. The first thing I thought of was, oh, this is like Inception. But I know, I, I'm pretty sure there was. Because I know that... um. Sorry, what's the director's Christopher name? Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan, he's, he was very inspired by one enemy. Paprika. But I forgot what the enemy was called. Ah, okay. I think there's a shot like that that he took from an enemy. And yeah, I agree. People associate that shot to to Inception. And it's kind of sad that it, they're using the same idea and the same visual imagery as, as that. So it's a pity, but at the same time, it still looks really, really cool. Yeah, and... I like Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange. He looks cool in that outfit. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I don't know much about Doctor Strange. So, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to this film. That's like, it has a very, very awesome cast. And I can't wait to see them on screen doing magic and stuff like that. And I, I, I really like that uh, there seems to be some sort of time lapse between his accident and how and when he becomes Doctor Strange. Yeah. So that was really cool to see. Or, or to learn about. So it will take place within a certain time span. And that's cool. Yeah. When Benedict Cumberbatch was first announced as a character, I was very much in the camp of, oh, you're just doing this because he's popular at the moment, because of Sherlock, and to appease the fan girls. So I was like, I don't think that's the best actor they could have gone with. But after watching the trailer, I'm definitely convinced I had... I, I don't doubt that he can pull it off. I just felt that it was a bit of a... A, a, a bit of you know too commercial a move but he's not a bad actor at all so he'll do it fine and the other thing about this is the nether realm or, or the world where Max Mikkelsen's character comes from when you have a little glimpse of that that looks cool I wish they had more of that as the main visual hook because that looks mm -hmm. like a really trippy place and I want this to be really trippy I want it to be sort of psychedelic and the whole motif is you can't trust reality because it's all perception, and, and that'll be fun. I still don't like Tilda Swinton as the Ancient One. That kind of sticks out to me. Yeah. I'm. This film is probably going to be extremely trippy. I don't know whether this will be a good, a good film for, like this mass audience because it, it's almost, feels very out there. Yeah. But then again, if you know Guardians of the Galaxy, but then again. Guardians of the Galaxy, it was a risk, but the story itself and the visuals were sort of, were very... Familiar. How do I say this? Familiar, yeah. yeah. And this one, it feels a little bit more trippy, a little bit weirder, and there's a lot of philosophical things going on. So I'm not sure whether the general audience would enjoy it. But from what I've seen so far, it looks really good, and I'm looking forward to this film. I'm, I'm, I almost forgot that this was coming out this year, so... It, I'm looking forward to it. November. So that's a great film to watch. 
there's more great films to watch this year, and Doctor Strange seems to be one of them. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> what did you think of the joke that they closed out on? What was the joke? Oh yes, I Shambhala. love it. I love so hard. <laughs> <laughs> We're not savages. I don't, it's it's kind of hacky. Like it's kind of like we threw a bunch of comedians in a room and they came up with this. But at the same time, I have to hand it to them. I did not expect the trailer to end with that joke or with a joke anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I love that joke. <laughs> it is a. Is this my mantra? Is it, no, this is the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> not savages. Oh, so man. yeah, there are a few. Like, you're talking about whether or not audiences will connect with the story. There are a few elements that I can tell you from the outset which probably will be pretty familiar. A, there's the white guy goes to Asia and learns Kung Fu. So that's something we've all oh. seen before. And B, Baron Mordo, who is the character played by Chiwetel Ejiofor, he's the, he's the guy who is training Strange under the Ancient One, but he then turns out to be bad because Baron Mordo is a villain in the Marvel Universe. So it'll be that part of one turns evil thing. Okay. Yeah, so I'm very curious to see how they're going to go about that because it looks like Baron Model and Doctor Strange are partners because they're working alongside each other. But eventually one of them will divert off. So I want to see how that happens. And I also don't know how Matt Mickelson fits into all of this, but his character design is so creepy. The whole thing with the cracked like, skin around the eyes is really creepy. And he's an awesome villain. So I, I hope that this is a cool villain. I hope that this is not a typical Marvel Cinematic Universe bad guy. Uh, I hope not too. And speaking of another Marvel bad guy, cinematic bad guy, Michael B. Jordan, I think he's going to play the villain. He's going to be Killmonger in the Black Panther series. The Black Panther so, standalone film. Yeah, standalone film. So I hope it's good. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about this character. <laughs> yeah, I, I. What I, is the Killmonger? Michael B. Jordan is so talented. I hope they don't waste him too. Yeah, we saw what happened to Human Torch. I actually well, he was good. He at, was fine. I liked yeah. him as Human Torch. Yeah. I mean, we saw what happened. He, with, with he deserves movie, better right? films, to be honest. I, or at least he deserves better roles. I I really hope that the Black Panther villain is good. I really hope that the 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 Doctor Strange villain is good because these are these are good actors, and I just I just need good Marvel villains. I know people like Marvel because of the heroes. But it's not fair to get these talented actors and then just give them the shittiest, most boring role possible and being just plot point characters. It's not fair to them. And it's also not fair to your audience who actually like good stories. And a good story is not a good story without a good villain. At least that's my opinion. Yeah, I feel that it's fine for your villains to be not really interesting at the outset when you're building the heroes. But now that all the heroes have been established, you have to move beyond that. You have to be like, okay, we know all of the characters who build up the Avengers, we know them back in time. So now we have to have a, a, a villain who will move the plot forward. And yeah, Michael B. Jordan is talented, and actually I, I really wanted him to play Cyborg, because he had been cast as Cyborg in Flashpoint, and he did a pretty good job, and I thought that I could see him as a live-action Cyborg. But they didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, they didn't do that. Okay, I think we're running out of time, so let's just end the show here by talking about movies coming out next week. We have Sing Street and with Jason Bourne. Oh yeah, we have so, Jerry's Dilemma. Yeah, so I, I will have a great... I will make a good decision with a coin. So hits for Sing Street and then tails for Jason Bourne. And... The, on da -da -da -da. the only justice in a cruel world is chance. <laughs> yeah, and it's still <laughs> so, so we're watching Jason Bond. Am I right? Nice. All right. All right. So I'm looking forward to that. Kind of sad that it's not Sing Street, but if it was Sing Street, I'll be sad that it's not Jason Bond. Exactly. And one day you, <laughs> Jed, you have to you have to put this in like your top ten movies of the year so that I remember that this movie exists. So you definitely aren't free tomorrow, right? Because I have a Sing Street screening tomorrow, and I thought that I could bring you to nope. it. No, so sad. I really. I really cannot go. No, that's, I'm so that's, sorry. That's, it's completely fine. Yeah. And so one day you can have a double bill and you can watch Jason Bourne and Sing Street back to back at home and you call it the Jerry's Dilemma double bill. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh man. Like, these, the thing is, I love musicals so much and Sing Street sounds like the type of, the, the type of movie that I yes. love. But Jason Bourne is... It's Jason Bourne. I don't love... <laughs> Yeah, I don't love the series, but I, I'm just so excited to see Matt Damon come back to play this character again. Yeah. 
and that Las Vegas car chase looks awesome. I I haven't seen any trailers for it. I just know people said that it's amazing, and I'm just looking forward to it. Yeah, it's Paul Greengrass again, and I hope that there's less shaky can. <laughs> oh, that will be it's Paul. Greengrass. It's Paul Greengrass, yeah. But yeah. I'm I'm glad they got Paul Greengrass back. Yeah, me too, me too. So see you guys next week where we talk about Jason Bond, Born Again. <laughs> thanks, Jerry, and thanks for listening, everyone. Bye bye.